Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Leadership Forum. I'm very happy to have the president with us here today. And uh, we don't have hail to the chief uh, <laughs> to, uh, to announce her uh, entrance, but uh, it's a delight uh, to have uh, Dr. Noel Cockett, our 16th president of Utah State University here. Noel, welcome. Yes, thank you. To the Huntsman School of Business. Won't you join me in yes. welcoming President Cockett? <clears throat> and um, I should say that it's been my privilege to know President Cockett since around uh, 2001. It was about 15 years ago, I think, when we were both met. She I think you were just newly dean of the That's College right. of Agriculture That's at right. that time. I was not yet uh, working for the university. I was uh, serving as a member of the board of the USU Research Foundation, which manages the uh, Space Dynamics Lab and other uh, uh, contracts over there. And Noel was a member of that board as well, so we were yep. colleagues then. And then uh, subsequently, uh, probably seven years together on the Dean's Council right. before you became provost yes. three years ago, yep. as I recall, yep. and now uh, president as of the 1st of January. I think we're very fortunate to be able to, here at the Huntsman School, to have you at this time. And I know it's a very busy time for you because you're right in the middle of your first legislative mm -hmm. session. That's right. Uh, defending the university and uh, getting yes. as many resources as possible. Noel, before we get into the uh, questions about leadership and what your goals are for Utah State University, I wonder if you might just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I understand you grew up in uh, eastern Montana. Can you tell us a little bit right. about your family growing up and where you grew up and where you went to school and so forth? Right. Well, um, I actually think uh, I give a great um, gratitude from the way that I was raised and the opportunities that I were, was given. I think for some people, they might have seen it more as a challenge. Uh, so as you've heard, I grew up in eastern Montana, outside of Miles City, Montana. It's the largest... Um, city uh, east of Billings, and it had 11,000 people when I was growing up. Uh, the next closest town was Terry, and it, it was 40 miles away, and that town had less than 1,000. Makes so, Logan look like a metropolis. Yes, <clears throat> yes. So very, very remote. And my father was a farmer. He was in a farming corporation with his brothers. But he died when I was in third grade, and I'm one of six kids. I'm right in the middle. I was the youngest of the big kids, and then there were the little kids. And uh, so when my father died, uh, we were 12 to 2 just every two years, 12, 10, 8, 6, 4, and 2. And my mother had a high school education. Uh, so she uh, eventually went back to school and became a nurse. But all those years of growing up, uh, I don't think we had much money. I don't know that we knew that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just the way it was. And, uh, but all of us started then working uh, when we were young, babysitting, you know, started with that, house cleaning, I ironed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we also went to a parochial school, first through 12th grade. Again, this little town had the public schools, but it also had this Catholic school. And uh, it was, most of my teachers were nuns, some priests, and some lay people. Um, so I think being in a private school within this rural community and getting an educational system from nuns really shaped me. And what it did was, uh, the, in the Catholic Church, you know, you're always, uh, guilt is one thing that they use a lot, <laughs> but the other is also living to your ability. You must do that. And so I was good in school, and uh, the nuns never doubted that. They never questioned that I should be in a class of math or science or whatever. I had the ability, therefore I had to do it. 
And so um, had a really great Same education. expectations as if you'd been a boy, the yes, gender thing absolutely. didn't play into it at all. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. What was it like, uh, I want to drill down a little bit on your, your uh, formative experience uh, there in Miles City, is that mm -hmm. the name of the, mm -hmm. the metropolis we're talking yes. about? Yes. Uh, did your mother remarry after your dad died? Uh, she did, but I was in college. She Bye. married a wheat farmer from North Dakota. Uh -huh. And I sometimes, I can actually hear North Dakota in my, my uh, speech. Being, <laughs> being on that side of Montana, yeah. it does kind of bleed in, yes. doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, and you're, what, uh, what did your siblings do when they left the house? You, you, you're in the middle. Uh, how many boys, how many girls? Uh, there's two boys and four girls. All of us did go to college. So my mother, I mean, I remember the time when my father was dying, and he had Hodgkinson's disease, which is a, a um, it turns out that farmers actually during this period of time, that was actually quite frequent because in those times you didn't worry about pesticides and herbicides and all of those things that you were doing. Um, so as he was getting sicker and sicker, he told my mother that we all had to go to college. He had not gone, my mother had not gone, gone but he worried so much about, um, I, I'm, I can't imagine what it would be like to have six young kids yeah. and realize you were dying and to just worry about their future. So to him, going to college was the way that we would survive. Yeah. So all of us have got bachelors and then four of us have masters and then I have a PhD. So we all did accomplish that. Did uh, anybody stay with the farm? Uh, no. Uh, so it was my father's family and they actually at one point came to my mother, said you will not be able to raise these kids. So we've decided which kids will go with which family. Mm. And uh, my mother had to fight them to keep us together. So she, needless to say, the relationship with my father's family then uh, struggled. So I but actually- But you did stay together oh, yeah. as a family. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we actually started w uh, working with my mother's brother who owned a ranch. And for those of you in agriculture, you know there's difference between farms and ranches. And so I developed, you know, a lot of animal skills. Uh, but that's actually interesting. I went to college, I was thinking I would be a veterinarian and because of the animals. But I've come to learn that I actually love gardening. And I think it is my father's, you know, just influence and maybe even genetics of growing things. And so you know, I guess if I had anything to advise people, there are so many forks in your path of your life, mm -hmm. and you don't realize at that moment that that will take you in a completely different direction. Mm -hmm. So just as a story uh, to illustrate that, um, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, but I went to college, and my first year away from home in Montana State, I actually partied quite a bit, and my grades were not good. They were not what they could have been. And Nuns wouldn't have been happy about that. Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and so it became clear I was not going to get into vet school because it's so competitive. Um, so I kept taking the same kinds of classes, maths and biologies and, and chemistry, and realized that I still had that ability to do well in that but it closed that door. Mm -hmm. And I always think of that, you know, uh, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't have my kids, I wouldn't have my husband, I'd be a veterinarian somewhere. So the moral of that story is party hardy as a <laughs> freshman. <laughs> yeah. Take whichever way that, <laughs> that direction, yeah. Um, so uh, this, you know, this growing up the way you did, put you in touch with animals. Yes. And uh, you didn't become a veterinarian, but you, you became an animal scientist. Do you want yes. to tell us a little bit about that? Well, um, one of the things that I love about Utah State, which I didn't really appreciate when I came, was how much we engage with undergraduates. Um, I don't know if you folks realize it, but Utah State is actually unusual in that with all the different universities that I've, I've had interactions with. Normally, that's a role 
uh, working with faculty that's reserved for graduate students. Undergrads just go to class, right. they learn what's in there, and they just go do whatever they want to do, I guess party or whatever. I actually played women's rugby both as an undergrad and a grad student, so go play rugby or whatever it is you want to do. So when I was a junior, I had realized that I loved genetics. It combined both biology and math, the two things that I really enjoyed. So I went to my teacher, the genetics teacher, and I said, so if I went into genetics, what would I do? And he said, well, you could become like me. And I said, oh, a professor, a teacher at a university. And he said, well, no, you could do research. And I actually didn't know he did that. Huh. And I was a junior. So again, you know, we, by our connections with the faculty here at Utah State, I think people are exposed to a lot more of the opportunities. So research sounded great. I didn't know what that actually meant. And I didn't go into a research setting until I was in grad school. But that's, that's what directed me. You know, the, the, the research you've done is very important, actually. Uh, I want to come back a little bit to the formative experiences, but just tell us about uh, your path-breaking research with uh, uh, cloning sheep. Right. Well, wouldn't he be surprised if I pulled this down and here was a slideshow and I could now talk about my <laughs> research? Uh, because I do get very, very excited about that. Um, so my background... Uh, is genetics, but at the time that I went into genetics, of course, we were starting with DNA, RNA, being able to sequence it, look at genetic variation. Uh, so that's actually the direction that I've gone. And uh, I have great colleagues from across the world, Australia, New Zealand, France, and the UK, as well as the United States. We all work on sheep genomics. And so with this collaboration, in 2014, we finished the sequencing of the sheep genome. If you would care, you can go and Google it and, and uh, pull that sequence down, all three billion bases of it. But uh, we've used it to look at genetic differences in animals. Uh, so one of the traits that uh, years ago I started with uh, is a, a mutation in sheep that causes them to have big rear ends. And they're so big that you could actually tell they have big rear ends. And so we were looking around for some kind of name. And my colleague from Belgium actually suggested we call it calipige. And calipige is actually a word that means beautiful buttocks. So <laughs> this uh, trait now, it's well known in genetics, in actually all of genetics, because it has an unusual inheritance. The only ones that show the big rear ends are those that receive the mutation from their father and the normal allele from their mother. All other combinations, including the calipige times calipige, are normal in appearance. So it's got this weird t twist to it. Um, but the, the cloning that Dean Anderson is referring to actually stems from uh, one of the other traits of these animals, and that's their meat is a little tough. And it's not even a little tough, it's really tough. And uh, I hate to say that, I would always say it has a tenderness issue. And somebody said, yeah, you won't say the word tough, but you use the word crockpot when you talk about calipige, because you actually, if you stew it, then it's pretty good. So I was bemoaning this fact that the U.S. sheep industry didn't want to use calipige, even though you don't have to feed them differently, you don't have to raise them differently, they just have 30% more meat. And a grad student from Africa came up to me and he said, have you ever thought of exporting this sheep to developing countries? And I never forgot what he said. He said, because my people do not worry about tenderness. And that always stuck in my, my mind. But sheep are quite hard to raise. They're a little more fragile. They get diseases, and they need high-quality feed. And if you look in the developing countries, actually a lot of those farmers use goats because they're scavengers, they're hardier, they can actually eat twigs and live off of twigs. So I always thought calipige in goats would make a good... Um, something we could really do to address uh, food shortage. 
So we have actually genetically engineered here at Utah State goats that have that calipige mutation. And uh, we've got three clones uh, on the ground. They're about six months old. But they have two copies of calipige, so they can't show the trait. It's not till we breed them to female goats to see if they've actually uh, can pass that on. So you're still keeping up with your oh, research. Yeah. Yes. How much uh, time are you going to be uh. setting aside to be <laughs> able to do research while you're president? Well, uh, it's always something I do off to the side, but I actually just got back from the American Goat Federation where I was talking about genetic editing and genetic markers. You know, being in an administration <laughs> in the higher education probably doesn't take you entirely away from the calipige. Right. I think we've seen a few of those in administrations. Oh, uh, calipige? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Noel, uh, talk a little bit about what it was like to uh, start your career here and how it evolved here at Utah State. Well, um, I work hard. Uh, so working with my uncle, who was a bachelor, he never did marry. Um, and my mother sent my two brothers and I to work with him every holiday all through the summer. So I started working for him when I was in fourth grade. So if you have a bachelor uncle who has a ranch, you don't get to say, I can't do that, or I'm, I, I'm too tired, right? I mean, he just worked us. So I have a really strong work ethic. And so coming to USU, loving research, uh, was just... It was a great, great move for me, and, uh, and getting to do the things I like. Um, I also like to teach, although I have to admit, I actually chose research. I was a 75% research here and 25% teaching, so it was a great, great opportunity. And that, you started here in 1990, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. that, and when did you finish your PhD at Oregon State? Was it Oregon State? That, yes, yeah. uh, 85. In 85. These, right, you folks weren't even born then, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking. Yes, so, it just seems like the other so day. So did you, as I, think, I think I remember something about you going to work for the Department of Agriculture, yes. didn't you? Yes, USDA. USDA. Yes. Where was that? That was Nebraska. Anybody from Nebraska? Okay, say what you want about Nebraska. Well, Nebraska is flat, let me say, <laughs> flat. And there's just mile after mile of corn. That's what they plant there. So when it starts out, you know, it's about this tall, and you can see everything. But by fall, it's taller than the car, so you just drive down a, a road, and all you can see is corn on either side. So. What drew you to Utah State? Well, the outdoor, yeah. the outdoors. I think Utah is beautiful. Absolutely so you play beautiful. rugby. Uh, what other sports do you like? Skiing, hiking, biking. How about oh, John, your brother, or your husband? How about John, your husband? Uh, what right. does he like to do? Uh, river raft, kayak, so and, and, camp. And he also was at Oregon State. That's wasn't he? where we met. And as I understand, he played lacrosse. Is that yes. right? Yes. So you were a couple of jocks uh, <laughs> hanging out uh, together. Right, right, yeah. yes. Love at first sight? Yes. Well... Uh, another word at first sight for me, my husband. <laughs> Strong attraction. Let's put it. So, that way. <laughs> uh, how long were you? How long were you uh, at Oregon State? We were there five years. Five years. Okay. And so, I was finishing up my PhD, and so I was interviewing for jobs. We weren't married then, and. Uh, and I had an interview at Davis, California. So I said, well, John, you know, maybe you should move there, you know, so. And he said, yeah, sure, you know, I could live in Davis, California. And then uh, we got, a, I got, a, I did not get offered that job. Um, I'll tell kind of a funny story. So, you know, I'm really excited. I'm interviewing for these big faculty jobs. And, but you're a grad student. I'm a grad student. So we didn't have much money. And, uh, so I have no idea where I bought these nylons, like maybe at the grocery store or something. Um, and I'm on this job interview, and these nylons are like begging. I mean, they are actually in wrinkles around my <laughs> legs, you know? And I'm like in this interview, 
And I'm, I'm there, and people kept coming into the room to interview me. But I was so self-conscious, I never stood up, because I'm trying to hide these nylons, right? And so people had come in, and I'd stand there and shake, or I kept sitting, and I would shake their hand, but I never stood up. So it's not a surprise I did not You know, I just job. want to acknowledge that uh, <laughs> this is the first president of Utah State University to ever talk about uh, her nylon. interview uh, with nylons. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you are the first female president. Let's, say, let's just sort of state the obvious. Uh, what does that mean? What do you think? What, what does it mean that you're the first president who happens to be a woman of Utah State University? Well, I think, you know, for me, again, my background never said you're a woman, you do this or you don't do that. I mean, that's just whether I was at the Catholic school, whether I worked on the ranch, um, you know, all of those things. I've never held that as um, something that makes me different. But I also realize that my story, I hope, can convince other women that they can also reach their dreams. And so I've just never, I love being a woman and I love all of the things that it allows me to do, but it's, I've never seen it as something that's um, special, if that makes sense. Yeah. So one other question about John, uh, and then I want to come back to what it means to be working in administration and leadership at Utah State. Uh, John uh, is a wonderfully, I, I know John, and he's a wonderful man, and he's a wonderfully supportive uh, husband. He's been principal of uh, the Malab City High School. Yes. Uh, he's now working here at Utah State University. Say a little bit more about your partnership with John all these years. Uh, well, what I was saying about the story about Davis was he agreed to move with me to Davis, but I didn't get the job. Instead, I was offered a job in Oklahoma State, which is Stillwater, Oklahoma. But by then, he had already committed to going with me. Um, neither of us really wanted to go to Oklahoma, so instead, I took the job in Nebraska. And uh, he is a very outdoors, very athletic. Um, he also you know, works hard. And so we were in Nebraska. We had married, and uh, we didn't have children yet. And so there really weren't the things that we like to do. I mean, because the wind blows in Nebraska almost all the time besides the corn. So, you know, if you bite, you went 100 miles an hour this direction, and then you fought this wind going back. Uh, even when it snowed, all the snow blew into Kansas. None of it stayed on the ground. So we were really struggling of what we could do for recreation. So we worked a lot. Uh, even on the weekends. And I knew it was time for us to move from Nebraska when uh, one Saturday we were talking, oh, let's not work, let's go do something. And Jen, John said, I know, let's go to Lincoln and go shopping. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, we need to get out of here <laughs> if my husband wants to go shopping. <laughs> so um, yes, it was time for us to come back west. <laughs> and uh, your two children were actually born here, after you came here, here right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you want to say something just about your son and daughter? Well, uh, Dylan is 21. He's in, uh, it's, a, it's a stackable credential, is what it, it's something that Utah State is the only uh, institution here in Utah doing it. And it's where you can go to uh, Applied Technology College, Bridgerland, complete a 900 hour program, and then those hours transfer into credits here at USU. So he's in an Associates of Applied Science and General Technology. Uh, welder, he's a welder, and then my daughter, 16, in uh, in at Mountain Crest. So I'm sure you folks were all terrific teenagers to your parents, right? No problems. You never caused your parents any problems. Well, my 16-year-old daughter, uh, she talks to me mm, maybe about 20% of the time. The rest of the time, just whoop, straight in her room. You know, mom does not exist. So I have a story on her when. Uh, the night of my announcement that By I was the president. By the way, let me president. just let you know, this is being taped. Oh. <laughs> we might want to edit this out. She would not <laughs> like me telling this story on her. Um, so, uh, so the announcement that I was president was happening. And she came up to me, and she said, Mom, I'd like to get a picture with you, and I want to post it on Snapchat. 
I said, okay. So she holds up her phone and she's turning it, you know, and she's fixing her hair and you know, whatever. And so I, I stick my head into this inner space there and she clicks the picture and I said, well, don't I get to fix my hair? And she looks at me and she says, mom, this is not about you. <laughs> <laughs> So. Well, we'll have to ask Chantel for permission to keep, put that on our website, but that's a great story. Uh, so. how, how long were you, back, back to USU now, how long were you, uh, was it before you got drafted into uh, a leadership position for right. USU? Well, so I was on kind of the fast track here. Mm -hmm. So usually it takes um, six years to get tenure and then X number of years after that to go full professor, but I actually got tenure in three years, and then I went to full professor in three years. So I was full professor when I had been here six years. So then three years after that, uh, the, they were looking for an interim dean of the graduate school, and I had not done any administration. And the dean of agriculture at that time called and said, would you like that position? And that's another one of those forks, right? I didn't really realize where that would take me. And I said, mm, yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> That's actually what I said. And so I started um, as dean at the grad school. And there are actually people that will come up and say, you signed my thesis or dissertation when you're in there. But I also was uh, pregnant with Chantel. Mm -hmm. And so this was a big deal, you know. Uh, we now have a dean that's going to have a baby. What's going to happen here? Well, the baby came to work with me. And I had a swing set, one of those baby swing sets, and I had a playpen and everything. She, she came for about four months. And people will also talk about that, how I had a baby. And when I'd have meetings, I had a lot of staff. They loved taking care of her. So they would just set her in her little chair up on their thing. And, keep working and so it worked out great. And so, you know, for me to see women having children while they're working, I mean, we can make it work. I mean, there was a point where, uh, where they get too big, right? Because they don't sleep all the time, but uh, up until that time, it Did you ever feel me. any discrimination or any, you know, I don't know, bias against you as a woman as you were coming up the ranks through Utah State? Not through Utah State, when I was at the USDA, and I still to this day, this still bothers me. Um, I had been a postdoc under a researcher, and it was time for me to have my own lab. You know, I had demonstrated that I could do this. And so um, uh, I went down to the director to tell him that it was time for me to have my own lab. And I still do not really know what he meant. But he said, well, um, I said, I feel like, you know, I need my own identity. I need my own projects and my own laboratory technician. And he actually did this and he said, you know, the reason that you feel that is because you're a woman. And I still do not know what that means. But he viewed, I guess, that you know, it was unusual for me or something. To this day, I don't know what he meant. But in my mind, I said, I will not work under him uh -huh. ever. And I left six months after. Yeah, so. yeah. People often say that uh, in business that you don't leave companies, you leave your supervisor. Uh, uh, well, that's uh, definitely. And that's what happened in your case yes. as well. Yes. Uh, so after d being uh, dean of the graduate school, then it w was your next step dean of the agriculture? Or? No, so President Albrecht, have you, some of you folks have probably had a chance to meet him. Uh, he was the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, and he actually encouraged me to stay as the Dean of the Grad School. But for me, uh, grad, uh, Dean of the Grad School wasn't really a Dean. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't have my own students, I didn't have my own degree programs. I guess I'm like, you know, I want my own thing. and. Uh, so it just, it wasn't something that I wanted to stay doing. So I went back to faculty after that rather than staying in that job. And then he called. He, uh, Kermit Hall, the president before him, had started, asked uh, President Albrecht to be his provost. And President Albrecht asked me to be his vice provost. Right. So I did that for a year and a half. 
then I became the dean. Uh, and uh, you were dean of agriculture for 12, 12 years, years and then provost. I'm not sure all of our students understand what a provost does. Do you want to say just a word about that? Uh, that's a very common thing. Uh, I would say they're over the academic side of the university. So as a land grant, we have three missions, uh, research, teaching, and outreach. So as provost, I'm over the education uh, part of the university. And then we have a vice president for research and a vice president for outreach or extension. So I didn't think of it this way, but the deans did report to me. I always thought I maybe more facilitated what they were doing, but yes. Well, that's your style. I want to comment on your style for just a minute. I want to just check and see how much time we have. OK, because I want to make sure that we've got time for our, our students to ask some questions. But uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to comment on your leadership style. You're very inclusive. You're very easy to work to, with. You're very easy to talk to. Uh, you're not intimidating uh, at all. I'm drawing some distinctions He's between. He's picturing me with those baggy knives. Well, what I'm, I know, I'm, <laughs> I'm, drawing, I'm drawing a distinction between you and some other provosts that I have uh, known yes. over the course of my career. Uh, <clears throat> and um, you know, you're a very determined person. Uh, and I think we now know from your stories where some of that comes from. Can you talk a little bit more about your style uh, of, of sort of being inclusive and, uh, uh, and, and wanting to make sure that everybody has a chance to be heard? Mm -hmm. Say a little bit about where that comes from. Well, I'm thinking of an interesting way to answer that. Now, remember, I'm a researcher, and I do genetics. So I work with lots of large uh, groups of animals, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, sort of observe them, measure traits, things like that. So I think I pull in still all this information sort of on a, as a researcher, looking for the right way to go or the right answer. Um, but I am very inclusive. I mean, I can't imagine knowing the right answer right like that. I mean. Mm -hmm. That's what we do as a researcher, is we're posing the question and then finding the information to get to the right answer. So being inclusive is just my way you know, to make sure I understand the whole issue and all that it contributes. And then as I've moved in these different administrative positions, that research question or that question just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger because it has more facets, it involves more people, it has maybe in some degree even more impact. So I, I need all that to know that we're moving in the right direction. The other thing though, it's hard for me to say I. I've noticed that about me. I say we, we need to move in the right direction. We need to come up with the right answer. Um, the other thing is the ability to change my mind. I mean, I may go in thinking I know what the right answer is, but, but realizing that more information could change the direction I go. You're a very self-confident person. You're, you're, I, I, will, really? I don't want to embarrass you, but, but you're also a humble person. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a combination of strength uh, but modesty uh, about you. Um, uh, uh, do you have any sense of where that's come from? No. Hmm. <laughs> no, I think uh, my mother, which I, mm -hmm. you'll all get to meet her if she comes for the inaugural. And she always does this thing with us kids. We're all so humble. She actually uses that word. We're all so humble. Really? It drives my brothers and sisters to be wild. I mean, it's like, why do we have to be humble? But <laughs> so there what's you your go. What's your definition of humble? Uh, not bragging. Okay. Not bragging. We're yeah. not to self-promote, yeah. not to yeah. sing our own praises. Yeah. Other people need to do yeah. that, I guess. You know, this is a time in America's history where we could use a little of that. <laughs> uh, so your mother obviously has yes. had a big influence on yes. your life. Yes. Um, uh, you know, to, I'm just trying to imagine what it was like to raise six kids, the oldest being 12, is that right, right when your dad died? Yeah. Uh, and the youngest being two. two. Uh, that's not easy. Right. 
and uh, uh, you say she went back to school and when I was became, school. and became a nurse. Yes. Uh, and uh, how long did she work uh, as a nurse? Oh my gosh. I think people in the audience are going to go, oh, I hope she doesn't model herself after her mother. She just quit as a nurse. At age? 82. Wow. <laughs> and you know, I'm thinking, if I went into a hospital and this 82-year-old woman came up to take care of me, you know, and it drove her wild, she'd say, oh, so-and-so came in, you know, for something. And he's like, you're still working? And she would be, like, really bugged by that. Well, I think it's kind of unusual, Mom, to, you know, to continue to work till you're 82. Yeah. But, so... I think you I would will. be very fortunate to have you work until you're 82 yeah. years old. Okay, um, just uh, some, some questions about the university then. Um, you're obviously taking over from uh, one of Utah State University's great presidents. Right. Uh, a tremendous growth in this university yes. during the time of Stan Albrecht as president, uh, both in terms of its physical plant, in terms of the size, the regional campuses, the success of the, uh, the um, uh, capital campaign, um, uh, the uh, entrance into the Mountain West, uh, and, and many, many other uh, things. Some people would say the toughest thing to do in leadership is to follow a successful leader. Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> what are your reflections about becoming president of Utah State at this juncture in history? Well, as, as you list those things off, it really is daunting mm -hmm. to think, how can I make an impact on the university? I mean, what's left? But I know there will always be more we can do. Um, and... Uh, I just, you know, again, to facilitate the successes that you and the other colleges have been able to do. I, I look at this, the Huntsman School of Business. I mean, whatever it is that I can do to keep making it great and, and growing. And to look out at you folks, knowing that you're going to be graduates of Utah State and the Huntsman School of Business is just, I mean, it's really, it's overwhelming. Uh, pride that I have in being able to contribute to that success. Okay. So how is that for punting that question? I mean, that's the problem. I'm not, not a problem, uh, but it's just keep, keep things going. Well, keep I think it, it is a, a challenge to yeah. any time you're following a success right. Right. to think about what the next uh, mountain is to climb and, and, and so forth. But I'm taking from your point that uh, there will always be opportunities to improve, that we're never done. Right, you know, that it's, exactly. There's, the journey is a never-ending journey right. of uh, growth and development, and, uh, and the opportunities will present themselves uh, along the way. That's absolutely uh, do you, are you Are there any particular concerns that you have right now about the state of, of, I mean, it's January, so we're talking about the state of the union and the state of the state. Are there any particular concerns you have about the state of Utah State right now? Uh, concerns. Um, you know, I, I see uh, our students are changing more. I mean, it's, it's hard to really describe this, but I did start in 1990. I was teaching. Mm -hmm. I stood up in front of a class and lectured for 50 minutes. And, you know, at the end of that, everybody would shut up their notebook and walk out. And today's student does not want that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's the whole um, electronic age. I mean, what I was giving to them, they could now just go out on Google and pull it down. So, you know, how are we creating uh, an educational opportunity that carries our students beyond just knowledge? Yeah. And that's, again, what I see so terrific about even these, do you call it? Friday free or yeah, uh, we what is the name of it? Focused Friday. Oh, not Friday free. Huh? No, 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 no. no <laughs> Sorry. Very, very <laughs> focused Friday. Although I have to say, when it's snowing like this, I have a, I have a sense that we're in real competition. Yes, with Beaver Mountain. Yes, so. yes, uh, yes. What, what is? This is the final question. I'll open it to the audience. What do you think the role of Utah State University is in, in the uh, sort of? 
uh, uh, by, uh, ecology of higher education right. in the Intermountain West. Right. So um, that is something that I do want to do, is carry our greatness even further mm -hmm. out and have more people want to be part of us. Mm -hmm. um, so um, uh, as I go around and I say I'm from Utah State, I've been noticing this the last five, six, seven years, but no, not in 1990. Um, when I go around and say I'm from Utah State University, everyone, it, there's been one time that someone has not referred to themselves as I'm an Aggie, and they say it with great pride, and they say it with great pleasure. And I thought about this. Now, I probably wouldn't have said this anyway, but I went to Oregon State, right? If somebody said, I'm from Oregon State, I would not say, I'm a beaver, right? I just, it, it, it doesn't even signal that, right? I mean, you know, I know we're orange and black, and I know the beaver is my mascot, but I didn't have that sense of belonging. I didn't have that sense of just pride. When we say, I'm an Aggie, it means something. Yeah. It really means something. And I'd love to have more people be able to experience that. And I come back again to what we do here at Utah State. I mean, we really take great pride and we're driven to make sure our students are contributing out in whatever it is that they want to do. It's right. not just it's not just classes. The world needs more Aggies. Yes. yes All right. Yes. Let's turn to the students and, and invite uh, questions from the audience. Oh, yes. Okay. Hello, Michael. Do we, have, do we have some mics that are going around? Sorry. Oh, here we go. Uh, one thing I really loved is um, your focus on inclusivity and the importance that has to you. I think it's safe to say that most students on our campus are having a very good experience. Most people are very happy. And I'd just love to hear your thoughts on maybe helping our minority groups on campus feel like they belong. Right, right. Um, yes, I'm just looking out here, seeing how much diversity we have. Um, wherever we are and whatever we do, we need to include people. And I think, um, there's so many great things that are happening here on campus that all of us could benefit from and enjoy doing, and in that, get to know people of different faiths, different races, different ethnicity, and from that, grow. Um, so it's, it's just about I'm an Aggie. You know, let's make sure we all feel that great pride um, my life has been enriched by traveling around to different countries, meeting different people, working with different people. And, and you know, I, the only thing I can, this is one story of, you know, America is, is revered in many, many countries. And someone said, you know, when my country, it was Australia, when my country elects a new president, nobody even pays any attention. When America elects a new president, everybody in the world pays attention to it. So I think we're given an incredible opportunity, but with that also comes responsibility to be able to see things through uh, other people's eyes, other people's culture, other people's um, backgrounds. And so this inclusivity that we can do here on campus, I think can also help us go out and do things better. So, um, so we're working on a few different things that I'd love to have our students engaged with. Um, I think our community also could benefit from embracing what we bring to Cache Valley, which is different cultures, different backgrounds, different faiths, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope that all of you will help me with that. Gosh, I hope we have more questions. I can always tell more stories, too. <laughs> uh, Madam President. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it just sounds good. Like, yeah. I just have to say it. Uh, That's the first time anyone said that. <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Colin Marsa. I'm, I'm here in the John M. Huntsman School of Business. And I just have a question for you in regards to 
to campus safety. Mm -hmm. Utah State is a relatively safe campus. Right. You know, but things still do happen. We're no different than any other university or any other state with being in Utah. But do you think that Utah State will ever hire more university police officers as in regards to, you know, things may happen. We don't know, but there could possibly be a situation that we may need to have more university officers. I know it's a weird question, but does that make sense what I'm trying to ask? Well, I, I think, um, so we've had, we've been in the news, in fact, national news recently for some, some sexual violence incidences. And I think what caught Utah State by surprise was that it actually happens here. I think that was our problem. You know, we thought, wow, we're really safe. Surely those kinds of things would never happen here. So if there's any benefit from what has happened is now we talk about it. And we can have conversations with our students, with our faculty, with our staff. Don't think this may not happen to you. Do not think this would never happen in your life. And so it's through awareness that none of us can really be insulated from those kind of things that will make us stronger. So I'm not sure it would, this type of incidence is absolutely uh, going to be solved by more police officers. What I think it is that all of us need to be active in keeping ourselves safe and keeping others safe. So again, it's a bit like the inclusiveness. We all need to take responsibility for that. So if you see something that's not quite right, walk up and ask. Um, you know, I think that's something we need to do as people, to engage, to, to pay attention, to really um, be active on. So, um, you know, I, I've never heard that we actually have a shortage of police officers. Um, I'm not sure that that, that would necessarily uh, solve some of these issues. What I think we have to do is all of us need to get more engaged in those kind of circumstances. So that might have been a little bit different than you thought I would answer then. Oh, it answers my question. I was okay. wondering what your thoughts are. Okay. President Cockett, thanks for coming and yes. spending time with us today. Um, I just have a question about how you continue to become a better leader. Um, some people like to read leadership books. Some people do self-assessments on their leadership styles. How do you continue to become a better leader? Or what do you do to try to enhance your leadership skills? Um, I really think it's giving time to it and really thinking about it, you know, solving that, um, those issues. Um, you know, I, I, have one, I have a couple tips about leadership that when I'm asked to mentor people, one of them is don't force a solution, okay? If, if it isn't right there and it doesn't seem like that's the right answer, you're not ready to make that decision. So give things enough time. So as I move up in leadership and as I spend more time on bigger problems, I've got to really spend a lot of time thinking. And so make sure, I guess I have to make sure I'm giving enough time to being a leader. Um, I worry about that um, because some of the things that I dearly love, I may not have time to do as much. and that's. That's something, research, mm -hmm. or gardening, or skiing with my family. I do worry about that because, uh, because leadership itself is now you know, going to take even more of my time. So if I did have a bit of advice, it's give it your, your time. Make sure you're thinking about it and how you can move forward uh, better. Some people have observed that as you rise in a hierarchy, 
uh, the nature of the problems that you are facing right. change and become more difficult. The, right. If there were easy problems, they wouldn't right. get to your That's level. That's absolutely right. And uh, uh, so you're you're going to you are being confronted and have been confronted already just in this short period of time since you were selected as president with some challenges that you hadn't faced before. So some of these things are brand new for you, right? Right. Well, so I had been in the job, so it was very anticlimactic, right, the shift from one president to another. So President Albrecht came in, closed his laptop, you know, we fed him pizza, he gets in his car and he drives away, and then I moved my computer into my office, and now I'm the president. So it was very, you know, <laughs> you know it wasn't like a real big special moment. And so the second night, I was at a men's basketball game, and it was the really snowing. This was the first time it really snowed. And I looked at my phone, and I had a text from the dean of science. And she said, are we closing the university tomorrow? I'm getting lots of questions about that. And I almost typed in, I'll check on that and get back to you. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I went, oh my gosh, I'm the one that decides that. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I was like, how do I make that decision? Uh, and so, you know, I had to ask a couple people. You, like, that was a, maybe called a George Bush moment. You know, he called himself the decider. Now you're the decider. Decider. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And so what did I do? I reached out to the people that would know, uh, the police chief, and we have a, an emergency response person, Judy Crockett. And I thought, you know what, if they know, they will probably be able to give me input on whether or not we should. The code do blue thing worked. I got three minutes. <laughs> okay. any, any other questions that we'd like to ask? Yeah. The what's that? Well, this one sounds kind of funny, but this is one I learned in the grad school. If you make an exception to a policy, you have made a new policy. Right, that's right. right? So this is something in the graduate school. It's full of policies like deadlines and forms and who can do what. And if I ever let just one grad student make that exception, I think they just had like this, you know, telephone tree out there because within like two hours I would get 50 more that wanted the same exception. Yeah. So yes, so there, that's my other one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam President. Thank you. And my name is Narsan Orta and I'm a student from the uh, cooperative program between oh, the uh, China. Northwest University and yeah. USU. And, you know, as an international student, I really know how hard for us to come to a, like a completely new country and to face everything is like difficult, not just about the culture shock, it's all about how people judge us and, you know, it's about everything. But I want to say not every international student, especially Asian student like me who can speak English like a you know, barely has no foreign accents. I still remember uh, the first week I went to the Walmart in Logan, and there was a guy, he, he told me, uh, where are you from? So I told him where I'm from, Hukar in Mongolia. And he said, you have no accent. Oh. So, so I told him, uh, really, I do have some foreign accent, right? But finally I said, OK, I'm Irish. So he gave up. <coughs> And I want to say, uh, from, the, from the, uh, the first day I got into the Utah State, the, this campus, uh, I got the uh, encouragement by the uh, Dean Anderson. And he told me some examples about his Asian friends being successful in America. But what I'm curious, not every Asian student like me can get the encouragement from the president or the dean. Uh -huh. So I wish how can you do to give us more support in the future to get us to in involved in this beautiful campus or in this town, like, you know, easier? So that's what I'm curious about. Well, I just want to say you've given us an example of how, of how we can do this by standing up, letting us meet you, hearing your story. I have a feeling that people are going to respond to you, want to get to know you more, 
et cetera. So I think just, you know, we all need to reach out and meet others. And so I actually will have some ideas for different ways that we can mix cultures and mix people. I love that we have international student council, and I love you know our different clubs. But we we need to do is embrace those, not just let them be. Does the are there is there an association of Chinese students? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, yeah, so I think the Chinese students, we need to make you know, other opportunities for you to engage with, with all sorts of different students. It's this whole idea we're melting pot, we're not silos. So. Okay, uh, uh, what I mean is, it's not just the, in a the level of spiritual, it's also sometimes we need the uh, financial support. Ah. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> All my classmates, Asian, Asian, you know, student, my, my Asian friends, they would like to stay at home to study or play the LOL. But <laughs> no, many of them would like to, you know, go to the campus and get involved in the, you know, colorful activities. So, but still, you know, some of the students, they work really hard, but they will have some financial problem about continue their schooling. Right. So right. that's one of another problem. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We have time for one more question and then He's we're going to take a break. Uh, oh, down, right down here in the front. Thank you for seeing me. Um, I love how you address the idea of an evolving classroom. That was really intriguing to me and I love that you're concerned about um, addressing that and adding value to the education we receive. I wonder, since you um, talked about how important undergraduate research was at this, this university, how unique that was to Utah State, um, do you see that uh, growing to add value to an evolving classroom, um, it maybe even becoming part of the curriculum in a way? Right. So um, I've actually held other positions uh, while I was dean. I was vice president for extension for about six years. And uh, one thing that that opened me is that when people hear research, they actually think of it as a laboratory or, you know, hypothesis, objectives, you know, results, materials, and methods. When we do undergraduate research, I'm going to say it embraces much, much more than a laboratory with a research question and a hypothesis and a conclusion. What I want is our undergraduates to do, just get involved in not only research in, with the capital R, but whatever it is that you enjoy doing. Um, so I'm gonna turn this back to you. So what do you hope to do uh, when you graduate? Um, What's a career goal? Yeah, uh, public relations, corporate relations, and marketing. Yes. So under undergraduate research, I hope under the small r, I hope you can go and maybe get what the legislative internship program, uh, maybe do internships through your corporations, maybe shadow um, some of the faculty that are working with corporations. We need to make sure that you get exposure and experience right now with what it is you want to do in your career. So yes, that's exactly what I want to build, are more opportunities for that. But that's exactly what Friday. Focused Fridays. Focused Friday. I was almost said it. Yeah. Free Fridays. Focused Fridays are about. That's, I'd love to see other students in other colleges have the same opportunity. Because Dean Anderson has definitely sensed that you folks need to have leadership experience, exposure, meeting people in businesses, making networks. What else are you hoping to do? Uh, we're, we've got panels from people right. coming in from different industries, right. uh, resume writing, career right. uh, uh, exploration right. opportunities. Uh, it, it, probably nothing, however, more important than the opportunity to hear from the new president of oh. Utah State University. So <laughs> thank you for coming. Up the thank you for coming and spending <laughs> this hour with us. All right. Thanks.